Hey, John Reed, JDOD. I'm talking with Sam Johnson of Equinix. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Second day of the cloud computing forum, and you just got out of a, a hybrid cloud uh, presentation. You said 60 slides. That must have been rapid fire. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was uh, just managed to squeeze it in 20 minutes. Yeah, so what, what is the hybrid cloud, and, and why do customers care about it? Uh, so, I mean, you know, the purists amongst us, and, and, and a few years ago, we first started talking about cloud. It was all about, you know, public versus private, and and so on. And I think that many of the benefits of cloud come from multi-tenancy and economies of scale. So you can emulate cloud by building a private cloud, but there's always going to be some legacy gear. Some things are going to require like PCI certification and so on. So really hybrid cloud allows you to use the right tool for the job. If you've got an application that's on a mainframe, then uh, you, you probably don't want to migrate that just for the sake of it. Um, but you may still want to use Google Apps or Office 365 or Amazon Web Services, but then you might also want to build like a high-performance computing cloud or something. And what that's about is a hybrid cloud is about connecting all of that together and having this, uh, this integrated solution that, that you know, does, has different components doing, doing you know, one thing well. Let me tell you one of my criticisms of this show, and I think you're going to have a response. There's been some talk about security, and I, and, I, and I do think it's an important topic, and I've seen it addressed pretty well the last couple of days. What I haven't seen addressed as well is the integration issue, which is you might have a cloud deployment, but for most large enterprise customers, they're dealing with a lot of legacy technology as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a focus of your work, I think, now uh, at Equinix. So tell us about integration and what to do with that. Um, so I think a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of integration is about standards, and I think a, a big part of the problem that we have today is there just aren't that many standards. And, uh, and if I put my Open Cloud initiative hat on for a second, what, when you look at what Open Cloud actually means, it's, it's about having open standard interfaces and open standard data formats. So that allows you to have programmatic access to data, and it ensures that the data is in a transport, transparent format that you can use. Uh, there's not really a lot of that. Today, the way that you do integration um, seamlessly is you have the same version of the same software running on both sides of the fence. So if you've got a public cloud provider like a, a Joint or GoGrid or something like this, if you can get a private instance of that, and in many cases you can, um, and ideally then run it in the same facility and get a cross-connect between the two, then you've obviously got some seamless integration there because they all talk the same APIs. Then you can get... Uh, you can get a uh, you know, management platform like Instratus to, to link it all together. But ultimately, I think where this will end up is where we have standards, uh, which mean that different uh, implementations, for example, Joint and GoGrid and VMware might all be compatible. Um, what I think we've done wrong so far is that we've tried to standardize the entire management piece, where in fact what we need is like an SMTP for the cloud. You know, Lotus Notes has its own APIs for talking to the Lotus Notes client. Exchange has its right. own APIs for talking to Outlook and ActiveSync and so on. But they can all talk together using this SMTP. So the focus <coughs> of my energies now is, uh, is on how do we make like an SMTP for cloud workloads. Mm -hmm. You said something that interests me about the difference between aggregation and in integration. Say, yeah. more, say more about that. Because so, I didn't quite understand that. So. so one of the things that I spoke about briefly in the presentation, traditional architectures have been quite tightly coupled. And the components are, if any one part of the system performs badly or breaks, right. then the entire system breaks down. Now what you do when you build a cloud architecture is you start looking at how you build reliability into software rather than hardware. And uh, in building a kind of an, an aggregation of components rather than tightly integrated components, you'll use things like message queues. And the example that I used in the talk was if I've got a front-end website which is taking orders for widgets, and then I've got a back-end system which is manufacturing widgets, and then I've got a queue in between, traditionally they'd be tightly integrated. If either mm -hmm. went down, they'd both stop working. But if I've got a queue, then I can keep taking orders even while I'm not making widgets, and if the front-end goes down, then I might not be able to take orders, but I can keep making widgets. So you get this you know, uh, it's a, uh, the loose coupling allows different components to keep functioning independently. Mm -hmm. So the one issue that I could see from a customer perspective around open standards is, who do I call when it breaks? Uh, how, how would you respond to that? Well, that's a, that's a tr traditional problem, I guess. It depends which vendors you use. Mm -hmm. um, one of the advantages of having open standards is that you can move from one vendor to another. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Previously, you know, if you're locked in to one vendor, let's say that you've got a large VMware installation, it's all VMware, and if you're for some reason uh, not happy or if there's a function that you need or a feature that you need that they don't want to implement for whatever reason, then it can be quite difficult for you to take that and move it in the same way that it was quite difficult if you had a Microsoft Office, you know, with the Office uh, Word document format. Right. If you, you know, you could, you could migrate it from Office, uh, you know, 2000 Service Pack 1 to Office 2000 Service Pack 1 quite easily, but anything else got really complicated, um, even within the Office suites. But if you tried to go to another platform like you know, Open Office or something like this, you'd often find that formatting would break and so on. I think that there's a real risk that we could end up with like an Office document format for the cloud. Right. Um, and in that sense, having open standards allows you to move from one vendor to another. Mm. One other thing that we've actually got in the open cloud uh, principles with the open, source, uh, open cloud initiative is that we require that there's an open source implementation. So um, what that allows you to do is if the, if the, uh, if the vendors um, you know, fix a price, then uh, and you know then jack that price up. You still have the option of going to an open source. Um, so are you implying that this could actually help customers get away from vendor lock-in? That they could actually say, "I'm out of here, and I can move this easily without as many problems." That's that's certainly the aim. I mean, what we're trying to do with the open cloud initiative is exactly the same as what the open source initiative did for for mm -hmm. proprietary software. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you look in when you're in a in a product world. And traditionally, software like Linux and so on has been delivered as a product. What you do is you say, okay, then when you convey that software to somebody, that triggers a requirement in the license to make available the blueprints or the source code. Right. When you move to a service world, and cloud effectively is just the migration from product to service, it right. all changes. Now, when the only tool in the toolbox is a software license, you end up things like the, with, with, you end up with things like the Afro GPL, which is where. If, G if good Gmail was under the Afro GPL, any user of Gmail would have to have access to the entire source code, which is obviously not going to happen. Yep. What we said instead is, we don't care what goes on inside that black box, as long as the black box has a well-defined interface, and as long as whatever comes through that interface in terms of data is in a transparent format. And, and so we've, we're, we're uh, basically dealing with the product to service transition. Okay. Well, less vendor lock-in is certainly a good thing. So Absolutely. if that happens, that's, that's a positive step. Uh, so we should wrap, but uh, just give me one more quick thing. Uh, the cloud is clearly established. We've got 4,000 attendees here. Uh, but for those customers that are not clear on what cloud can do for them, what, what would the one step be that you'd recommend them take this year to, to get a little more comfort level? Uh, I think that the, the first thing that any customer should do is look for low, low, lowest hanging fruit. Okay. So identify things, ideally things that are generic. So communication, collaboration. You're not going to get a competitive advantage by running an email service. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get a competitive, it's similar, you don't get a competitive advantage by running data centers. That's why we run, we run data centers. So pick the things that are, um, th that are generic. Then you need to set up a transition plan. So you would do things like, for example, set up a single sign-on service. Okay. Ping Identity are here. We use, I, I believe we use Ping Identity for our Equinix on Equinix platform. And then that allows you to bring in things like Salesforce and Google Apps and Box.net. And I can use my corporate credentials to access all of those services. Okay. And, uh, and once you've got that, then you can start looking at some of the more challenging migrations. Okay, to be continued next time, thanks.